For three years, they had walked with Jesus. They saw him perform signs and wonders. I mean, he healed the sick. He raised the dead. He gave sight to the blind and hearing to those who could not hear. In John chapter 13, he gathered his 12 disciples around one table, one table. They ate a good dinner together, and halfway through it, Jesus got up, and he started washing the feet of his disciples. And one of them said, oh, you're not going to wash me. And Jesus said, well, you'll have no part with me unless I wash you. And he said, well, wash my hands and my feet and my head too. Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And then they sat back down and started eating again. And, and Jesus said, one, one of you is going to betray me. And they started thinking, well, which one could it be? And they asked Jesus, and he said, it's the one to whom I give the bread. And he gave the bread to Judas. And Judas was ashamed and scared, and he got up and ran away from that dinner table. And Jesus started talking, consoling the remaining 11, a new command I'm giving to you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you are also to Love one another. Oh, their hearts are distressed and worried, and their friend, their mentor, their Savior is about to sacrifice himself, and they don't even know what that means. And so in John 14 and verse 1, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus said. It's in my Father's house or many dwelling places. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go there to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you into myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And Thomas just spoke up and said what everybody else was thinking. Jesus, we don't even know where you're going. How should we know the way? And Jesus answered to all of them, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. John chapter 15, he's still sitting around this table with his remaining 11 disciples, trying to console them, prepare them for what they're about to face. And he says, man, I'm, I'm the vine. You are the branches. Abide in me, and you will bear much fruit. And then he gets down to talking about the Christ-like kind of love that he has, and he's displaying for them. And he says, no one, no one has greater love than this that he lay his life down for his friends. Chapter 16, he's consoling them with the counselor's ministry, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. Jesus has to go away so that the Spirit can come. It's better for them. It's better for the remaining disciples that Jesus goes away so that the one Spirit can come. And he says, when the Spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all of the truth. And their hearts are sorrowful, and Jesus knows his friends by now, three years with them, and he is the son of the living God, and he sees straight through their eyes into the depths of their souls, and he sees the sorrow and the fear deep inside their minds. And he says, you have sorrow now, but I'll see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take away from you this joy. No one. And then chapter 17, this is right before Jesus gets up with his disciples and walks alongside the Kidron Valley late into the evening, and he ends up at the Garden of Gethsemane where you know this story. He's going to pour himself out in prayer before the Father. Father, not my will, but yours be done. Take this cup from me if you can. Nevertheless, not my will, but, but yours be done. So this is right before that moment, right before Jesus gets up with his disciples, walks down the Kidron Valley, and then... Uh, and then into the Garden of Gethsemane where he surrenders completely to the Father's will, and you know what happens next. So here's John 17. Around the table, this one table, Jesus just starts praying out loud. And in verse 1, he prays for himself. Father, glorify me with the glory that I knew before the foundations of the earth. Father, re return that glory to me. Jesus starts by praying for himself. And then verse 6, he makes a pivot in John chapter 17. I pray not only for myself, but I pray for those whom you've given me, the remaining 
11 disciples. Oh, and he prays for their souls. He prays that they would endure the hour of testing that would come to them. And God, give them the glory that you've given to me also. So in verse 1, he prays for himself. Verse 6, he prays for the disciples. And in verse 20, he makes one more pivot. In verse 20, he says, Father, I pray not only for them, that's the 11 who are around this one table, but for all who will believe in me through their testimony. Now, who in here has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ unto salvation because of the testimony of the 11? Okay, now I know you've read this passage before, but I want you to think about it this way. If you told me that the Son of God filled with the Spirit of God, prayed out loud to God the Father minutes, maybe hours, before he found himself on his knees sweating drops of blood before what was to come ahead of him. And he prayed for me. I would ask, what did he say? Verse 20, Jesus prays to the Father, may they all be one. As you are in me and I am in you, may they all also be made completely one so that the world will believe that you sent me. When we say one family, the South Carolina Baptist, it's not just a cute phrase. This has to be at the core essence of who we are. It has to be. Here's why. In John 17, 21, Jesus directly connected the effectiveness of our gospel witness with the degree of our unity together. Think about it again. May they all be one so that the world will believe. I have in my office, I don't know if you've ever been to Israel before, been to Israel, love it, it's amazing, changes the way you read the Bible, changes the way you pray, preach, and teach, you need to go if you haven't gone. One thing I wanted to get more than anything else when I was in Israel is I wanted to grab a, uh, what are those clay um, uh, lamps, you know what I'm talking about, like the oil lamp, and so I went and paid way too much money for one, don't tell my wife, but I did, way too much money. Uh, me and my, my tour guide was also an archaeologist, which was really convenient, so I let him touch it because he had to tell me whether or not it was the real deal. And then uh, they wrapped it up in a piece of paper, and I carried it with me in my lap all the way home. When I got home, I put it in a glass display case, and it is now in my office. When you come sometime, you're welcome at the office, you can see it. But guess how many people on this side of the Atlantic Ocean have touched that oil lamp? Me. That's it. You know why? Because it's precious. And anything that's precious is also delicate. And I would tell you, I think the text is really clear for us today. That outside of the gospel itself, Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of sin. For anyone, anywhere, including you here right now, down through the generations, across the geographic spectrum. Anyone, anywhere who would repent from sin, believe on him, call on his name. He'll wash them clean from sin, free them from shame and guilt, and write their names in heaven for all of everlasting life. That gospel, other than the gospel itself, the most precious thing we can possess is oneness. Because the effectiveness of our gospel witness is directly tied to our unity as a body of believers. May they be one. So at South Carolina Baptist Convention, man, God has blessed us, blessed you extravagantly in all seasons. And I think he's called us to a new season together. A season of oneness, a season of unity. To be one family means we got about 2,000 churches in cooperation. Honestly, I think that number is actually like 1,611 who actually invest and come attend, you know, like come and invest in the ministry. So more like 1,611. Uh, so 1,611 churches, half a million South Carolina Baptists worshiping in them every Sunday morning. 42 associations, eight entities serving 10,000 college students. Some of them you saw 
here, a BCM that ministers to 240,000 college students across the state of South Carolina on 32 campuses every single week. You're serving 350 senior saints who are thriving in their sunset years because of your support through the South Carolina Baptist Ministry of the Aging. Right now, you're scholarshipping almost 150 children at Connie Maxwell Children's Home who otherwise would have been left in deep and desperate and dark situations. And right now, they're living life surrounded by a family of people who actually love them and who share the gospel with them and disciple them regularly. You're all over the state of South Carolina and literally the world in communities ravaged by disaster and crises of many times, many kinds through our disaster relief. You're scholarshiping 20,000 seminary students on six different Southern Baptist seminaries. You're, you're fully funding the work of 3,500 missionaries through the International Mission Board, 252 of whom today are South Carolina Baptists almost in every single time zone across the globe. That number will be 253 next month when we mobilize one more South Carolina Baptist. 6,500 chapels and church uh, planters all across North America, all of them funded, all of them supported, all of them encouraged because you are faithful to give and to be involved in the work of South Carolina Baptist. I just want you to know, all of that, I'm so proud of it, all of that can fall apart in a moment. And it'll happen when we lose the value of one. South Carolina Baptists are one family. And we have one mission. We're accomplishing it through one cooperative effort. And if you're looking for a reason to disassociate, to not cooperate, you don't have to look far. But if you're looking for a reason to cooperate, because God has called us to this in our time, Please look no further than John 17, 21. May they all be one so that the world will believe that you've sent me. I really don't have a lot of fancy, compelling words to share with you today. Instead, what I want to do with the remainder of my time, maybe just a minute, maybe two minutes, is I want to pray with you. And I want to pray to the God who hears, who cares, and who can, that he would make this true of us moving forward in South Carolina, that we'd all be one so that the world will believe. I'm going to invite you to assume a posture of prayer. I'm going to kneel right here. You can kneel where you are or bow in prayer, whatever you want. I'll give you 15 seconds to move, and we're just going to pray together. Lord Jesus, you've given us, given us a very clear commission, and it is great. It's greater than any one of us could accomplish alone, any church could accomplish alone, any association, or even state commission could accomplish alone. You've built it, you have baked into the bread of the great commission the necessity of oneness, cooperation. And Lord, not only is that a, a practical necessity, it's a biblical necessity. Lord, we, we have to be one so that the world will believe, Jesus, that you were sent to the Father. Our gospel witness of South Carolina Baptist is intricately tied to the unity of our faith and its expression as a body of believers. Lord, I'm praying for my friends who came today, and Lord, I, I know I'm pray that they got great tools and ideas and concepts and all those things. That one thing maybe that they're going to apply when they go back. But Lord, I know what's probably true even in their circles of influence and their ministry areas and in their churches, God, there's some, there's some disunity there. And here we are talking about oneness and singing amazing songs together and praying to you and listening to scripture and it's amazing. But God, in the back of their mind, they're thinking, this is tough. This is hard. And Lord, so I pray by the work of your spirit, God, that you would guide them and guide those in those churches and ministry areas uh, into your truth. Holy Spirit, would you come alongside them as a paraclete, a paracletos, and that you would come alongside them and guide them into truth and encourage them along the way. Lord, there are people here right now who really, really need for you to just encourage them 
and show them that, that they can lead toward unity, toward the necessary oneness for a more effective gospel witness. And God, I pray that, I don't even know what it's going to look like when they get back, but Lord, I pray that through the work and the power of your Holy Spirit, that even right now in this moment, you would comfort them because you are the great comforter. And Lord, uh, our mission field is vast. Vast. 4.2 million South Carolinians who are not going to be in an evangelical church this Sunday. Who will reach them if not us? And when if not now? But Lord, we have to be one. So God, I pray that you would make this true. The things that I've just said are true of us. God, would you sustain those things and make them true? Lord, there are a million reasons for us not to work together. But there's really just one for why we have to. It's because the effectiveness of our gospel witness is so closely tied to our unity. So Jesus, Father, make us one as you are one, so that the world will believe the gospel we sing, preach, pray, and share. Lord Jesus, we ask this in your name, for your glory, by your power alone. Make us that people. Make us one family.